welcome to Painter Bread Quarterly Slush Pile. We have so much exciting things to tell you because this is a very different episode. Remember, remember those after school specials that were always a very special special or the special episode of this or that? This is a really special episode for so many reasons. Um, we've had guests before, but we've never dedicated an entire show to a guest in a particular topic. And we're doing that today. Um, so uh, Richard Nash, who some of you may know, uh, contact, connected me to Jim Hannes via email. And um, he came down and spoke for us. And um, we were immediately in, enamored. And um, he now teaches in the graduate program in publishing here. And um, Jim, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and tell us uh, where you are right now. Jim and Jason are both remote. Um, so tell us about you for a sec, Jim. Sure. Uh, I'm calling you from HarperCollins offices. I work uh, in marketing at HarperCollins by day. So I'm huddled here in a little <laughs> conference room, stealing an hour from the day to be on your podcast. Thank you. Um, thank you. It, it, <laughs> and I'm also a short story writer. I have a collection out there from ECW Press called Why They Cried and have, you know, been, I guess, Put it throwing my things into slush piles for the last 20 years, I suppose. Wow. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. So uh, I guess we'll stay remote for a second and let Jason say hi. Hey, Jason. Uh oh, Jason. Uh, hi, hi. Hi. It's me. I'm here. Um, I am in Brooklyn at my yellow Parsons table in my home office in Bedford Service in Brooklyn. Wonderful. And um, this this voice that you're probably already annoyed by is me, Kathleen Volk Miller, <laughs> um, in the recording studio. Um, and I guess one of the reasons why this episode is so special is because Marion Wren is not in Abu Dhabi, but right next to me, close enough for me to put my hand on her knee and tickle her every now and then. It's so nice. <laughs> it's so nice to be tickled by Kathleen Volk Miller. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, so, hey, Marion. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. And sitting next to me is... Hi, I'm Caitlin McLaughlin, and I am sitting next to Marion. <laughs> I <laughs> am... Tickle, tickle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the digital communications co-op for Drexel Publishing Group. I've been working for PBQ for about six months, and I am an English major here at Drexel University. <laughs> and I am Tim Fitz. I teach first-year writing here at Drexel University and creative writing at the Curtis Institute of Music. And I've been reading with the Painted Bride Quarterly for about three years now. Yep. Yes, indeed. And he's also been submitting work for more than 20 years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, after Jim uh, uh, was teaching in the publishing program, we went out to dinner one night and we hit on this topic. And, um, and we've been waiting all these months to have this conversation conversation. So, uh, Jim, why don't you tell us um, what, your, what you propose to the literary magazine world? Absolutely. So, yeah, when uh, Kathy and I went out, we started talking about uh, the slush pile, right? So, you know, we uh, things are submitted and, uh, you know, magazines have to read them and, and go through them. And, and uh, about six years ago, I wrote an essay about this because there seemed to be a lot of tension around the slush pile out there in the literary blogosphere. Uh, it was about a time, I think, that Tin House was requiring you to submit a receipt from an indie bookstore uh, <laughs> with mm -hmm. your submission. And there were some other uh, magazines that were out there that were charging uh, I, I thought pretty outrageous pr uh, reading fees, yeah. um, which you, which were suggesting to me that the the economics, uh, and I mean that not just in a financial sense, but kind of almost the labor, the the, the, the exchange the, 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 the exchange of value that went into the slush pile was kind of out of whack. Mm -hmm. So um, as I kind of said in my introduction, I'm a, I'm a, a writer, but I've also worked in marketing for a long time. So I, I, I hear the siren of Silicon Valley thinking, which is always <laughs> like, well, with new technology, are we still working on old assumptions that we shouldn't be? working on. So uh, I wrote an essay called Let's Kill the Slush Pile mm -hmm. based on kind of uh, looking at whether it made sense to still have the slush pile. And and it had a few premises that I think we'll get into, but 
but but the way I kind of analyze things is is how does open uh, how do open submissions really work, um, and what were the premises that made open submissions work, um, and, uh, um, and I think that a writer when they submit to a literary journal can get can can get three things they can get feedback. I think traditionally that's something that they would expect to get. They can get an audience. In other words, that in a world before the internet, um, I really needed to get something in a journal that had a circulation for basically anyone outside of my immediate family to see it. <laughs> and then, uh, f- <laughs> and then finally you could, you, you get um, certainly some reputation credits uh, for it to, to sound very geeky, right? right. So, uh, such and such a magazine approved my uh, work and they, and they liked it. Right. Um, but is that, is that what they need now anymore? Um, because they don't really need literary journals for audiences. Um, and matter of fact, I think a lot of people, uh, people have bigger Facebook followings than a lot of journals have. So, um, my proposal basically was, since there was a lot of, um, agita going on at the time and all this labor that was going into reading the slush pile is what if you took all that labor and instead of, and took all your readers and made them not readers of incoming material, but basically scouts who went out there and scoured the entire internet for the writing that was going on out there and then, um, and, and, and then acquired it and brought it into the literary magazine. What if? <laughs> what if? Well, what I mean, if? and like I said, I almost ask it in an economic way. Like if, if this is so much labor, which people seem to think it is because they keep putting roadblocks on it. What if you just took the same, that same team of people and assigned them to find the best work on the internet? Yeah. That's an interesting premise. Um, I know what I think, but I'm really interested in what the rest of you guys think. Oh, I want to hear what you think. You can say it. What, what's what's well, on your mind? Well, I think, I think my, biggest, my biggest fear would be, um, hasn't the literary magazine always been around to celebrate the new voice and, and all of those kind of corny things? And, and yes, Jim is right. You know, you can have your own blog. You can have your own Facebook. And you might have more followers than a mag has readers. But doesn't the mag still... Um, vet the work doesn't it still give you some cultural cachet that self-publishing on your own blog does not isn't isn't that a value an economic value um and and what about those people who don't have their wherewithal energy know-how smarts (laughs) whatever we want to say to put up their own work somewhere else like what happens to them those new voices that were celebrated in lit mags i mean think about just even paint and bright quarterly you know we love to celebrate how many people we published who are now famous in our microscopic literary world but famous you know uh we you know we have a, a list i don't think we should maybe get into right now but we're proud of having found authors who then hit it big yeah so that's what I think yeah so I I this is Marion again and I, I think Kathy put your finger on something it's like the the literary magazine wouldn't change with with Jim's model here right like the lit mag is still conferring legitimacy on the people who are published in the lit mag right okay. exactly but exactly it's the, it's the slush pile that if that disappears, it's dispersed into the internet, as it were, right? And now all of, like the the readers are searching and scouting rather than like searching and scouting through the pile that was sent to us, right? And I guess that's that's the thing I would want to like I don't know problematize a little bit because. Like, at least with the slush pile, they've licked a stamp and stuck it in the mail with the presumption or the assumption on our part that they've looked at PBQ a little bit (laughs) to know that this is where they want to place their work. Now, I know that's a freaking fallacy and a fantasy of the uninitiated (laughs) because most people just send shit out. Right, like, and I don't mean to and be rough. And there's no stamp licking anymore. Right? And I don't mean to be so rough <laughs> in that language, but really, it's like it's much easier now to submit across the board Absolutely. as long as you're tracking your own simultaneous submissions. So there really is no indication 
it, with the palms appearance in our slush pile that there is like real devotion to PBQ, right? right? So now I'm talking myself into Jim's idea. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's exactly what you're saying is that I think that when when you actually had to lick a stamp and and send in a, a you know self addressed stamp envelope, then submitting to PBQ was probably a higher predictor of compatibility with PBQ right. than it is now. Right. Right. But I also, I would say too, I take Kathy's point. Like we, we have this assumption that everybody's got digital access, right? And that we're yeah. all savvy and can post stuff and, and tweet and blog and, and cultivate our audiences. And that is, I think, a wrong assumption for, for all artists. Like we can't assume that all people who conceive of themselves as poets have that savvy too. Maybe someday down the road, right? But certainly not, you can't make that a, a global claim it's just not true Mary, if i'm not mistaken didn't weren't you on a panel years ago about exactly this topic and someone said i just want to have like my clearing house of poetry yeah. and then you guys can all find it and track it down <laughs> yes you yeah, that, 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 that definitely happened, happened. Yeah. Do you remember? yep there was there was a, it was at an awp conference and the room blew up there was i think chairs were thrown i'm pretty sure somebody who i won't name walked off the stage <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, all that happened because he said, I want to send you uh-huh. uh, all, uh, 80, 80 pages of my poetry and you pick what you want. Right. How do I know what you want? <laughs> so, Jim. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, I mean, I I, 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 I would maybe side with that person. Oh, I'm throwing chairs in the air. <laughs> no, 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 because I think it's. I mean, I just, I always want to be. I always kind of interrogate myself as a as a kind of literary. I mean, like I don't like to watch a video on the web. I don't really, you know what I mean. I like to read words. That's you know, and and I already feel like I'm becoming a dinosaur. But I like to test things that I believe to find out if they're really just true or if I'm just used to them. So, so we, we've created some sort of thing of the, the author picking the thing and sending it to us is somehow the sacred transaction, right? But, but isn't that kind of making it easy on the, on the, on the editors? I mean, isn't the editor's you jobs should, really to, to, the to, to, to that's the easy part. I mean, if you think it's easy to sit down with, you know, like 100 or 200 or 300 manuscripts that people have sent you because they think that you're really going to care about them. But I mean, I think it would be a much um, if, if we're just talking about, you know, I'm going to find who there's buzz about. And so we'll just Facebookify this and we'll say whoever can get the most followers gets the most attention. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, that's already what happens. But now, you know, like that person who's working away, you know, without a lot of recognition, who is trying to break in, you're making it that much harder for them mm. because now you're saying they're never going to get read. Right. I mean, if you as long as there's a slush pile for a young writer or a beginning writer or an older writer or an unrecognized writer to keep sending to. And this is why I'm so frustrated by um, submission fees. That person at least knows they're getting read. They at least know that to some extent it's not rigged and you would basically be taking that away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I lived that for a long time, Jason, (laughs) when I was living abroad and, and writing and, you know, just stuck in your hole trying to crank out stories. The slush pot was all I had for a long time. And the, the idea was just make it in there, get it into the right people's hands and um, and then build from there. You know, that gives you credibility as a teacher. As a, I mean, as a writer, it's so it's so shameful when you're a fiction writer and you don't have any publications. And the other thing is to, to build on that a little bit as a teacher, about half of my students um, crave the physicality of paper. When they read p- stories, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they like to have either the printed copy or the copy itself, and they can't read on a screen. And I, I know the world's changing, but I think that, that, that that's half of my best students. And the students I, I, I believe in the research, and I, I haven't done the research myself, I just keep hearing it presented at different things that I go to, um, shows that students prefer to read on paper when they're doing um, engaged and focused long-term thinking Mm -hmm. and the reading on paper continues to kind of activate more parts of your brain and increase focus whereas reading on screens like when i read facebook if someone has an update that's more than you know like 50 words like i'm not reading it 
Right. I just keep looking at yeah. pictures. Right. Okay. That's how I feel too. Even as um, an undergraduate myself now, I feel like I can't focus as well if I am just staring at a screen all day. It's easier for me to actually write down my annotations, um, to actually have the physical book or the physical printout. I think that that's always something that's going to be around regardless of this digital age that we're that we're in. But with, with that being said, I really like, uh, I think it's important to take a multifaceted approach where I really like Jim's idea of scouting things. So I like to go look at literary magazines and find stories of people who, uh, that I connect with and then look at their bios and Google them and then reach out to them to only rely on a slush pile is, is also, I think, impractical. But if well, I'm, I'm actually very proud that a, another journal that I work at the Bellevue literary review, I take almost exclusively from the slush pile. Mm. Um, and, you know, a lot of people assume that everything is solicited and people assume that it's rigged against them. And in a lot of ways, I feel very frustrated because I know that the people who are the most frustrated with the editorial process are the people who I'm saying are the best served by the slush pile um, because they're, they're the ones with the lowest chances. And I, I do. I get solicited um, frequently for work. And, and, you know, I understand that solicitation happens, but all of that is happening and taking away the slush pile um, is just kind of removing a way for people to get in on the ground floor. All of the stuff that you're talking about where people are like, oh my God, that poem was really exciting. Um, like the Max Rifa poem in the New Yorker was a really great poem. And, you know, I'm sure he's being solicited left and right right now. Um, that doesn't mean that you should get rid of the slush pile. Let, let me state it a slightly different way, which is that the slush pile is out there. I mean, we're not getting rid of the slush pile. It's just not coming to your inbox. I mean, there's an right. endless stream of smaller and smaller journals. I mean, I don't have a good answer for somebody who's completely disconnected from the Internet. But there's certainly and I'm not talking about just Facebook education, but there are. I mean, there are so many tiny literary journals where people are slaving away. And it seems to me that it should be at least some part of the curatorial function of the upstream um, curators to go out there and find the gems. So, so the slush pile exists. And we're not getting rid of it. I mean, it, it already exists and is accessible to everyone. Right. And so at the end of the piece that you wrote, right, your last line is... Wasn't your piece called Let's Kill the Slush Pile? Yeah, but the last line is... <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm being... Long live the slush I'm, pile, I'm, right? Long, or long uh, live slush, right? So uh, yeah, I think, death I, I to the slush your, pile, long live the slush. Right? Like, so I, I get it, right? Like that we are caught in this like torrent of images and torrent of information. We are, we are in that flow, right? So it's sort of just like reconceptualizing the slush pile as being something within the magazine to being something external to it. Right, that it's out right. there, that it's that it's navigable and searchable. Right, right. slush is out there. Slush is out there. But you're right? not going to have your own pile. Oh my God, we're buried in. I mean, and that goes into the two other things that I made in the piece, which I think are I think are getting even more true. Is that there used to be two premises that were considered holy 10 years ago, which is if something is available for free, people won't pay for it. And here's the one that's if something is already online, people have already seen it. Right. Which is, you know, I mean, I think there's, uh, I've actually kicked around, the, I actually kicked around the idea of a blog that would be called The Gatekeeper. And all I would do is find things online and pay people $500. It'd be like a MacArthur Genius Grant. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I would go, I liked your thing. I'm going to give it $500 and I'm going to promote it in my curatorial system. I think you should talk to the people at LitHub and tell them that that's what they should do to you, <laughs> right? Like aggregating the, what what is the the best, right? But then like kicking some money back to the mm -hmm. author, right? Is <laughs> right? is actually pretty great. Yeah, no, I well that's the interesting part. Yeah, that needs to be fixed because now we're in a exactly we're in a model where we where we curate but don't but don't pay, it, right? Right, and there's this idea of exposure as pay. I mean, I know that um, not that it's a literary journal, but I know BuzzFeed was getting in trouble recently for not, um, you know, compensating or giving ownership to the author as their right for them. And they were angry about that oh, because wow. the idea was that they were getting all this exposure. Like that's what BuzzFeed was putting forward. But the authors weren't happy with the compensation or the mm -hmm. level of ownership mm -hmm. that they had over their work. So how much um, is exposure worth? And um, 
I guess that's just the question. How much is exposure worth for right. a new author? Right. I, I do think it's really important, too, for the writers. I mean, anyone like yourself, Jim, and I, I've been submitting for years and years, there's a certain point in that process where you think nothing's getting published. It must be somebody else's fault. And <laughs> at that point, you either continue living your life like that or you realize my stories aren't that good and I've got to figure out how to write better stories. And uh, there's a there's a lecturer at Penn who has that now famous TED talk about grit, Angela Duckworth. And I think the slush pile is a really great place to generate grit because you mm. you for years you submit, you get a couple of bites here and there, and then you get nothing. And then you have to ask yourself, what am I doing? I'm 30. Am I going to keep writing or I'm going to give up? And then you you either you either dig down or you don't. And I think um, for for writers, that's an important uh, wall to get past. And I, I think it lives in the slush pile. So I think that I don't I don't know the uh, the TED Talk reference. Like, can you say what is what is the argument she makes about grit? She's talking about how grit can overcome intelligence, basically. Oh, interesting. Right. So, and perseverance yeah. is a more necessary quality for success. Right, like a moderate right. amount of intelligence. So, but that yeah. goes back to something I think that, that Jim talked about a moment ago, which is the, quote, the sacred transaction right here, right? The sort of upflow, right? People submitting to the magazines and that that's the transaction. And I, I, I wonder about removing the mechanism of the slush pile inside of a magazine completely takes that element of grit or the the mechanism for for developing grit out because if the slush pile lives outside of the magazine that's just a passive the 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 writer keeps writing and then it's on the editor to do all the active work of of recruiting right right, and soliciting right so so now the writer is in a much more passive position rather than being persistent or like envisioning and being sort of mindful and intentional about where they want to be published. So I think that phrase transaction is exactly right, Jim, right? And that it should be a balance, right? Then perhaps there is a balance. And in the way technology flows now, we do have that possibility for like interactive participatory engagement with each other, which is neither on one side or the other side only. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I make a very, you, I make a very flip side note here about submit the word submit, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. You know, the writer submits their work to the uh, to to the journal, and the, and the question is like, will. I mean, I agree that grit has been formative, you know, the slush pile is formative in certain ways, but will current or future writers even deal with it? Yeah. I mean, they may su- their work may suffer as a result. Um, but I mean, they, they just may sidestep it. They may choose not to submit to this process. And, right. um, and, and obviously I'm not, suggest- well, I mean, I, I mean, uh, maybe every journal could do this, but I think it would be interesting to see what kind of vision a journal could generate if it was entirely scout based. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. Well, I think just from conversations that I've had with classmates, um, it seems as if a lot of people feel that the slush pile is not worth it. I mean, I've talked to some people who say, you know, I don't want to wait six months to a year for my submission to be looked at. I'd rather just, you know, have my website um, generate my own content online, those sorts of things. But I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think that um, for me, the slush pile is, again, a formative experience, something that... um, yeah. I don't know. And you're I talking expect. about young people in their very early 20s, like college students. Right. I mean, I'm 20, so I'm anybody around my age. Right. Well, do you guys- when you're, when you're 20, you're a totally different person by the time you get your response. But <laughs> <laughs> you really want to push back against this idea that the slush pile is somehow not a necessary outlet for fairness, that the slush pile is doing the work of giving everyone the opportunity to participate. And it it happens in different places. So if you're a poet, your slush pile is much more likely to actually be at a journal. Um, If you're a poet, then you're very likely to have slush piles for the rest of your life. If you're a fiction writer and, you know, if if you're a nonfiction writer and you're likely to get an agent, um, a lot of that slush pile work is being sent to agents. And agents are doing that work of reading slush piles before they're doing the work of trying to place those stories or place those pieces in magazines and journals. But I mean, I really think that this notion that we can sort of either downstream it. So I don't know who's doing, you know, I, I mean, I feel like I'm pretty far downstream 
um, in the literary universe. But I, I just I, I think that the that we have to talk about the slush pile as a fundamental valve for fairness that lets everyone participate, um, whether or not they're ready to participate, whether or not they should be sending work to the slush pile yet. But but the fact is they have the opportunity. They, right. Their work does That's get right. read right. by someone with some knowledge of literature. And they have a, you know, they have like a 5% chance, a 3% chance of getting out of the slush pile. But that is a real chance. Um, I, I feel like I have to say this. Jump on me if this is not relevant. But um, in this past spring quarter, we had a course here on agents and agency. And we had five different agents from different agencies come in. Um, a couple of really big agencies. I'm not going to name anybody or their agency. Um, but most of those agents said that they barely looked at the slush pile. And they did what Jim's talking about. They scouted. Mm -hmm. They found authors on uh, Instagram, uh, lit mags they trusted, word of mouth, other authors on their list. There was one person who only reads the slush pile on her phone in transit and knows that that means she's not, you know, as thoroughly absorbed. You know what I'm saying? Um, So, I don't know. Is that a relevant thing to bring up right now? Then that's agents, not lit mags. But... Is kind of interesting to all I think it is relevant. I mean, I think it's totally relevant. I work with a lot of book clubs. We read, um, you know, popular novels. Um, You know, I bring a short story or a poem into those conversations, and and some of the participants in those book clubs would get, like, angry at me because the the poem is, quote, hard, and I have air quotes here, right? Like, but it's, it requires a different kind of time and attention than ripping through a big novel, right? So I think an agent looking for a novel that would be a mass seller has a different motive, perhaps then the literary magazine editor who's who's looking to catch attention focus that attention for a smaller one of these people well, as long as your only goal is to make money and if you look at the people who've been scouted the people you know who have these enormous instagram followings for their poetry um i mean you know they make rod McEwen look like walt whitman i mean you know these people you know it's, it's garbage it's people that would things it's like maddie stepanik who want to consume it and spit it out the people who've been really successful it's all pornography um you know i mean that's the title of the episode. no i'm serious twilight is just not twilight um 50 shades of gray right i mean it's, it's yeah. just fan fiction the, the i forget the woman who's erotic novel just got her a six-figure deal that she started on Wattpad. But yes, as as long as your only value is money, then yeah, let's get rid of the slush pile. Well, Well, the agents I'm talking about weren't only popular novel people. There was a literary agent also who did the scouts and solicits. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah, Kathy, I would take take that up. I mean, I think that the slush pile is what allows people to say that there is access but I think it eases the work of actually having to make sure that there is that access. Yeah, you know, because people, because things don't really go through. I mean, in the piece, I compare it to the Republican American dream, right? Yeah. Where you could end up being rich. Everybody has equal opportunity to it. But in fact, um, you know, you really don't. And you kind of start to feel that when the places that have inherited this idea of the slush pile as a kind of democratic institution start instituting things like send in a receipt or something that are really kind of show a real resentment towards their submitters. Mm-hmm. You know, there's almost a, you know, revolt of the masses type elitist backlash against the own obligation of the, of the slush pile. Yeah. Well, one time on this podcast, I forget which episode it was, but we did discuss uh, what you're talking about now, the the um, charging to submit yeah. and the variations that have grown within that. Um, there are places that are now charging you. Uh, if you choose, you can pay a higher fee and get a critique. Um, if you choose, you can pay a higher fee and get your answer in two weeks. So people are really monkeying around with the uh, fees, reader fee, uh, submission fees, and um, it's getting all sorts of variations now. Yeah, and we've we've gotten just a little bit of pushback as well. So we instituted a reader uh, submission fee, um, and we've had one or two of our um, submitters, long term submitters, write us directly and, and protest the 
yeah. the fee, right? They um, can just send a self-addressed stamped envelope, can't they? Instead, they could just and do right, that, yeah. They could do, yeah, mm-hmm. just yeah. like jump out of the submittable. Right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. Yeah, the ones that seem not too onerous to me are the ones that basically, to go back to an earlier conversation, basically create the same friction that putting something in the mail did. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, to slow it, you slow mm-hmm. it down to pre-internet levels. Sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, by just putting a little bit of friction in there right. um, yeah. to, to kind of just restore it to the balance that it was before. Right. Although we do know magazines who actually did put that reading fee uh, as a, as a, like a, I don't want to say a stopping mechanism, but, you know, as Marion was talking about earlier, to make people think for a second, do I really want to submit to this particular magazine? They were mm-hmm. th- just like hard copy used to be. In fact, I was, you know, such an old lady about it. I really stood at the online submission gate for a long time. The rest of the staff was saying, we got to do it. We got to do it. We got to do it. And I was afraid it was going to open up the floodgates of hell. And it did in some ways. We get far more simultaneous submissions than we ever did. We get submissions that truly aren't finished. Right. (laughs) Um, But. Back in the day when you had to print it out and fold it up and address a self-addressed stamped envelope and put postage on that envelope and the outer envelope, I always thought those mechanisms might make one be more thoughtful in who they're sending to. And um, so some magazines have implemented the 2 and $3 low fee like we have um, in the hopes that it'll slow people down. But I've talked with a few editors at very big magazines who said it did not at all. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers did not change in what was coming in. Right. I, I do really want to say this right here. We are only charging so that we can pay. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. are turning around and those submission fees go right back to our published authors. So right. uh, we're, right. we're, and that, we're not getting massages uh, up in here. A, a word on that too, right? Like, and this, and it's this question of value, right? Which is really what we're talking about. Like, like the labor of the slush pile or the labor of reading, but really rewarding the writers for their time, for the work that they've done, for the, for the, for the art that they've created, right? And, you know, PVQ has been around so long and we've never been able to consistently pay authors, but we're, we're, we've turned that page and we're, we're aiming towards that because that really should be, I believe, you know, a, almost a political mission that if a writer is, is producing art, that should be rewarded more than just the, the, um, you know, the sort of like the, the praise or the legitimacy conferred, right? Mm-hmm. Which is actually well, a real value, a real value that, right? But, sure. you know, it's it's also super hard to do this because lit mags exist on the margins of the market, right? And yeah. I don't know if we should keep a foot in that marketplace or, or subvert that marketplace because it is a subversive, transgressive thing to keep doing this kind of work for as long as this magazine's been doing it, so... And the, and the other ways that writers, you know, were supported, I mean, in many ways, the bottom has fallen out of academia mm-hmm. um, I mean, for a long time in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. You know, having a significant number of publications was sufficient to get you a really good teaching job where you really could make a living. And fine, if they're not paying you, it, it doesn't really matter because what you're being paid by is, is the university. Right. And that has become, you know, increasingly impossible. And then in the rest of the publishing industry, um, you know, how many, what, what are we down to now? The big five um, publishers? Correct. You know, the, the, publish, the publishing industry has eaten itself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's <laughs> maybe two or three mid-list presses and then everything else is tiny. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there, there was also a, a larger apparatus to support writers in financial ways that has really dwindled. Um, and, and most, I mean, very, very visibly since um, the turn of the century, but, you know, e- even more drastically since the um, recession of 2008. And you're right, Jason, I, it, you know, lines on your CV uh, rather than, you know, five dollars from a literary magazine. Like you're not you're not going to be cashing that check, run into the bank with, you know, um, with that small fee. But the, I guess the the principle of it is that the literary magazine is making a commitment to the, the craft. Right. Knowing full well that sometimes the that that line on the CV is where you're going to be able to convert the capital. Right. Like you're going to be able to, you know. 
apply for the promotion Absolutely. or secure tenure or get the job, right? Because of the of the publications that you've scored from reputable, prestigious places. Um, yeah, right. And that's it's what we're talking about is the first step, like getting your foot in the door. And and I think if I could take this back to Jim, is the idea that the slush pile in practice is actually just a fiction. <laughs> Right. Like, is it just a fiction? It's like this belief in democracy, but really that's not the way. I, I guess what I'm saying is that having the slush pile open is an easy way to to present your enterprise and perhaps even present it to yourself as entirely <laughs> open. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, huh. That would, if you actually had to scout it and then create, um, curate something that you thought was politically credible would um, require other efforts, um, other decisions and more exa- examination of <laughs> bias perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. How how would that be the case? So if I'm if I'm trying to find people who already have platforms and already have followers, so that I know that when I'm putting forth something in a journal, that it's already being read, that that the person I'm putting forth already has readers. What biases do you think we're bringing to the slush pile? I mean, I would say in the last like, I mean, just on this podcast, I probably have known three of the writers out of a good say twenty so far. I mean, what I bias do you think we're bringing? I wouldn't say scout on the basis of popularity. I'm saying get out there and find the best work on the internet. Right. I'm not saying the most popular work on the internet. I'm saying, you know, don't, just because somebody raised their, you know, the, the, the fact that they raised their hand and said, you, 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 you know, Tin House, I would like you to look at me. Mm-hmm. is probably going to be a narrower group of authors than if you if you made it your mission to find the underappreciated works that already exist. And how will that ever be as broad as a slush pile? What do you mean how will it ever be as broad as the slush pile? You don't think the entire internet demographic doesn't totally outstrip the demographic of the people that submit to Tin House? Mm-hmm. So every morning I would just get up and I would like Google poet. I mean, I think that I'm challenging you to figure out how to do it, but I think that it's a challenge that curators have to do. No, I mean, there are reporters that make it their business to learn what's going on. And you go and you, you read the tiniest magazines you can find to find the truly genius work that I'm sure is out there and overlooked on the internet right now, instead of, instead of just taking it out of the people who got their MFAs and know how to submit to the slush pile. But, but aren't we the small magazine? Aren't no, we that there, there, are, there are smaller magazines. Oh no. Are you kidding? <laughs> you do in this world. I mean, I'm talking about little, I mean, there's so many tiny blogs, little poetry about people putting out their poetry. There's just, I just think that there's, un, I, I still think it's just too gatekeeperish to, it, it, to say, um, you know, when you've gone to poets or whatever writers digest and found our name and this esteemed thing and then submitted to us, then you are ready to, um, to be recognized by us. I'm concerned about who is going out and looking for work on the internet because of I don't know, let's say diversity of voices Um, because diversity in publishing is such a big issue. I'm wondering who decides what's important to read or what we want in our magazine. I guess that's what I'm asking. Well, I guess. Can can I take issue with something that came like to I go back? (laughs) But like the idea that we as editor, because I get I get very upset when people treat editors as gatekeepers rather than as curators Mm -hmm. and thinking about us as kind of sitting in a room like, oh, hello, wonderful author. We give you our imprimatur rather (laughs) than actually saying, wow, we're really excited by this work and we want to share it with our readership. So the idea that we're these gatekeepers rather than curators is already kind of like like uh, I'm I'm not on board. But anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. Uh, Jim, I knew when you just used gatekeeper right now that Jason was throwing chairs. <laughs> He's well, throwing chairs up there in bed style. But but uh Jason, Jim also has used the word curate a lot. 
Yes. <laughs> and Caitlin, to answer your question, the people are, the scouts are that editorial team. And I guess that editorial team would have meetings and talk about who they're looking for or not who, but what. And, I, you know, we're already, we already trust our process, mm-hmm. painted by quarterly's right. process, because when the work gets brought to the table, we have these diverse editorial teams in three different cities, right? Mm-hmm. And that we vote. Yes or no. And I've been with the magazine more than 20 years and you've been with it six months and your vote is as powerful as mine. Right. Mm-hmm, right. So that's all of the things that we've put our trust in for the 43 years that Painter Bright Quarterly has existed. That was the editorial process we inherited and kept. So wouldn't that still happen if we were all now scouts and we turned outward? You'd pick in, bring in something that I wouldn't and Tim would bring in something that you wouldn't. Right. Would that happen? Right. Yeah. I've never thought of it. So I, I, right. Tim wants to get in on this, but I just want to say, too, right? The actual real um, problem of time and attention and labor. We have talked about PBQ soliciting more. Like, hey, we have to solicit more. We have to solicit more, solicit more. And then who's got, you know what I mean? Like, we all have jobs outside of this, right? We're all, like, Ain't working on our own, like, writing as well. You know what I mean? So it is, yeah. I, I love Jim's vision of this, this Blue Skies vision, and also would love to see us get paid. <laughs> right? For that, for this For, this for the joy. amount of time. You think it's more time. He's saying you're not reading a slush right. pile anymore. So we... We talk about doing both things. We do slush right. pile and we solicit. So right. maybe, you know, if you jettison one and only focus on the other, it frees up right. the time and the and the labor, right? And, and Jim, I'm not, I don't want to name names. You know, maybe if you come back down to Philly and we have more drinks, but <laughs> I'm not going to name names on this podcast. There are lit mags who solicit more than they, um, they publish more solicitations than slush pile, right? Uh, we all know. Sure. Right. So they actually do get, um, you know, mo- people don't respect them for doing it that way. Mm. The magazines that are based more on solicitation, you know, like especially if it's names. There are magazines that solicit names. Sure, not, not what you're just talking about. So how do we risk? How do we? I mean, it seems to me every lit magazine that's launched in the last ten years right. launches with a completely solicited right. issue of editors. Right. Absolutely, and it gets people a little rankled, right? People get a little bummed out when they see that taking place. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, it's a different thing. I mean, I'm just, yeah. I just still find it very curious that it, that we that somebody has to send it to me to know that it's that it's there. It just feels very old to me. <laughs> you know, when there's when when the, I mean, literally, the internet is full of writing. So I one, one thing, and then Tim's jumping in this. One. I think you I just mean, put your finger on something, Jim. That that it really is kind of important like when when old technologies were new right like when the when the internet which now kind of feels a little old right when it was yeah, brand exactly. it, has new, a, right? it has a history now we, we were doing pbq is old enough the slush pile was in existence when the internet was new right so i would argue that the slush pile is like maybe like the first iteration of a kind of participatory culture. That is where the reader slash writer is submitting to the magazine, right? Which is a kind of interactive principle that the, the you know, the, the digital world celebrates now, which wasn't necessarily seen as available. And here it was living inside the world of literary magazines. So I, that's that's my two cents. And Tim's been dying well, to get into there's, this. There's two points. So one, I, want, I agree with Jim. It does feel old. And sometimes it feels awful reading the slush pile for days and days and days. And you feel like it's never going to break loose and you're never going to get anything. And then you get Clara Fang and then you get uh, Terry DuBose uh, raccoon story. And suddenly (laughs) you got that. And you, and you know, and I know Terry Dupo from the way he from the way he wrote his story, and from I, I googled him and looked at the stories he's, he's he wrote in the past. He's just not going to have his website and be putting stuff up there. And that and this is one of the best stories I've read. Episode twelve. It, it, and, <laughs> I mean, it's one of my favorite stories of the past two years. I love. I've I fell in love with the story, and I don't think it would have come across any other way. And it's a, it is an uphill climb, and it is. It, it's called the slush pile for a reason, and maybe it should be called something else, even worse. But <laughs> but there are those little 
nuggets. And the, the second point I wanted to make was there's some moments I get walking down the street or taking my kids <laughs> to the park where I get this flash of horror of what it would have been like at age 22 putting my work up on the internet and having that documented for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I just scroll mm, on my knees and I thank God <laughs> that I could have sent it to somebody who would just send me a piece of paper back and then navigate the world in that way. And uh, I have students who do that. I have, I have good students who, who have their own blogs and it's horrific. <laughs> <laughs> and it's there for the rest of their life. That's who they are. I often feel that way. I have my own blog and I hesitate to, I hesitate to put content out there because I worry that, you know, in t- even two years, I'll look back on it and think, oh, God, why did I put yeah. this up here? Yeah. Your girlfriend yeah. says you like you there for the rest of your life. You think it is asking Chris Cooper how he's doing getting his stuff back from Google. I mean, frankly, like, I mean, this idea that everything sort of stays around, like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, if you're just putting up stories that no one else is reading, you can take those down and they'll be gone. The worst ones you know will stick. <laughs> That's just how it works. You know, the one you wish would disappear stays, and the, the good ones, it's just seems like how it works. But, but I do find it touching that here on this podcast, we're not worried about, you know, posting drunk pictures of ourselves in college where we're, <laughs> we're shivering to think that an early George Saunders <laughs> ripoff we posted will live forever. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah, I think we need to wrap up. I don't know if anybody really wants to get in one last parting word or chair or anything. Well, I have a question good? for for um, for Jim as a as a parting question, which is, what are you writing these days? <laughs> Oh, well, it was funny. I was going to ask everybody if people submit to the slush pile. And I have to say that I do not anymore. I do not. I stay out. To, I do not submit to the slush pile. And uh, I don't know. I've been I'm a short story writer who's been battling. I've been in the desert for years trying to conquer the, the book. Nice. Yeah. So so All we right. shall see. I absolutely send work to slush piles. All right. Yeah, I send. Yeah. I send all the time. Yeah. I, I just got a, a book through the slush pile uh, last March, or last May. I sent it in March. And wow, that was a fast yeah. turnaround. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> That's where we got to end. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so last in 2013, I had sort of a strange year where things were coming back quickly. I sent to Shenandoah, and they got back. They accepted a story within a week. Wow. And yeah. The Baltimore Review did one in less than 24 hours. Wow. And uh, and crazy. I you know I had a stack of stories that had been out a year and um, I mean that is usually not like that right you know, yeah it's just right. a good a good little yeah, period the years there. after yeah. or harder <laughs> yeah well listen I just want to um, thank Jim again yes. for being our very special yes. guest today thank you Jim Hannah yeah Jim Hannah um, <laughs> we would love well, no. to um, hear from our uh, listeners as to what your opinion is on all of this. I mean, very funny that our podcast is called Slush Pile and <laughs> Jim's essay is called Let's Kill the Slush Pile. But I'm sure he wasn't thinking about our podcast at the time because it didn't even exist. <laughs> so um, please stay in touch and always um, and keep reading. Thank you very much. podcast is produced through a joint venture of Drexel University's Office of Information Resources and Technology and the Painted Bride Quarterly Magazine. This podcast is the property of Painted Bride Quarterly Magazine. All rights reserved.